The reaction of sodium and chlorine is a vigorous one. We use sand to protect the flask from excessive heat. Then, we fill the flask with chlorine gas. Next, we add sodium. And then a few drops of water to activate the reaction. The reaction produces sodium chloride. When sodium and chlorine react, the sodium transfers an electron to the chlorine forming oppositely charged ions. Although the compound has no net charge, its component ions of opposite charge attract each other to form ionic bonds. In turn, these ions are attracted to others, and an ionic solid called a crystal lattice is created. You can argue in the real world that nothing happens without money, like you need money to make transactions, to buy things, etc., etc. In science, the equivalent kind of uh, somewhat negative view of the world is that you can't do anything without energy. So let's talk a little bit more here about those ionic bonds, those interactions between positives and negatives. And the fancy name for positive bond, positive ions connecting to negative ions, the fancy name is called an electro static force. And you could see when sodium chlorine, chloride was being made there that there was a lot of energy being given off. This is a very exothermic reaction, which means energy is given off. And that's basically like making money in the real world. If you can have an exothermic reaction, we're going to see that's a pretty good thing for most of science. And that's a conversation we're going to be developing over this whole Chem 221 through Chem 223 sequence. But for right Right now, just realize that when you have an ionic compound with positives, negatives going on and on in three dimensions, up, down, left, right, forward, backward, very strong forces. And the forces are called electrostatic forces, which means basically positive charges attracted to negative charges. A crystal of potassium bromide has a distinctive shape with perpendicular edges. This shape directly reflects the arrangement of the ions in the crystal lattice. The compound is composed of alternating potassium ions and bromide ions. Sometimes you can see in the real world, the macroscopic world on the left, uh, what's happening on the atomic world there on the right. And those ionic compounds, potassium bromide, I believe in this case, very, very strong. So you can actually see the crystalline structure there on the left, which is kind of a cool thing. Ionic forces or electrostatic forces are very strong. There's a law called Coulomb's law, which tells chemists and scientists in general how strong the electrostatic forces are, because some forces are stronger than others. And it's important, I think, at this point to talk real briefly about Coulomb's law. Now, if you've taken physics, you will have seen something that looks like this. This is the official version of Coulomb's law. And in Coulomb's law, you calculate a force, and the force has so many newtons, a type of connection between them, and it's related to those things. We won't use this as an equation in chemistry. All right, we're not going to actually calculate newtons. We won't talk about the proportionality constants, that K and stuff like that. However, we can use Coulomb's law to kind of in a hand-waving way to tell how strong things are. Um, the force, which is how strong the positive negative charge is, has two pieces which are going to be really important to us. The top part of the equation is the number of positive and negative charges charges. So you can imagine that for something like sodium chloride, you would have a positive one, and you'd have one positive one, and you'd also have one negative one. So positive one times negative one, basically a factor of one, and that's pretty strong. However, if you have a magnesium and oxygen, or oxide as magnesium oxide, you'd have a positive two and a negative two, and two times two is a factor of four.
What that means for us here is that magnesium oxide, a lot stronger of a force than you have for sodium chloride. I like to think of it as handshakes. Each positive charge is like a handshake. I mentioned something about this earlier. So sodium chloride would be like a single handshake between a positive and a negative. Magnesium oxide with a positive two, negative two, that would be like a double handshake, and that's even stronger. But there's another factor we have to think about, and that's in the denominator of this equation, and that's the distance between the ions. Now, if you want to shake someone's hand and you're across the room from them, you can't can't shake their hands. Your hands aren't literally long enough to do it, all right? You have to be within a certain distance to make it happen. So as the distance between the positives and the negatives gets higher, or the distance gets farther from each other, then the force goes down too. There's like going to be some ideal distance that makes the forces happen. These little pictures right here show examples of this. Um, first of all, this is a lithium ion and a fluoride ion. And when they come together, there's some idealized distance D between the radius, the middle of the lithium, and the central part of the fluoride. And as that part gets bigger and smaller, that's going to affect the bottom part of Coulomb's law. Now, in part B over here, this is like a positive one, negative one handshake. So sodium and chloride, and that's pretty strong. But the one below it, this would be like magnesium oxide, a positive two, negative two, and that really makes it happen. So this part right here is important. As the ionic charges increase, the force of attraction increases as well, makes the charges stronger, and that's really important. Now, the far right side here shows the distance part. Here's a very small distance, and here's a very large distance. So let's consider the small distance like two people shaking hands, all right? And that's a good distance. But then if you increase the distance, like across a table or something, then it's kind of awkward to shake someone's hand. So the force is smaller as the distance increases. So this is the other important part here. As the distance increases, the force decreases. So these two parts, the parts right here at the bottom, are both going to be important in future discussions. As the charges, ion charges increase, the force of attraction increases. Also, as the distance increases, the force will decrease. And we're going to see lots of uses of this in the next several chapters. As the ion charge increases, the attractive force increases as well. So the first blank there, you would put in increases. Ion charges go up, the attractive force goes up. On the other hand, the second one, as the distance between the ions increases or gets bigger, the attractive force decreases. So it gets harder and harder to shake someone's hand as you're basically walking away from them. And we're going to use this in several uh, upcoming discussions. Again, we are not going to actually use Coulomb's law for calculations. That's something that physics will do. But in chemistry, we'll use Coulomb's law to explain why some bonds are stronger and some are weaker. This is an example of two ionic compounds, and the first one is sodium chloride, which is positive one, negative one interactions. It's a very strong bond. If you were going to melt table salt, you'd have to heat it up to more than 800 degrees Celsius. So very, very high. That's not an easy temperature to get to. Like most uh, stoves certainly would go much less than that. You need some pretty special equipment. So sodium and chlorine atoms are holding on to each other really strong. And it's in three dimensions, forward, backwards, left, right, etc., etc. However, magnesium oxide, positive two, negative two, you've got that double handshake going on. And it's much harder to break apart positive two, negative two than it is positive one, negative one. So if you wanted to melt magnesium oxide, which is a way to see how strong it is, 2800 degrees Celsius, a heck of a lot higher than sodium chloride. So this is not easy to melt. And what you're seeing here, the left hand side is a positive one, negative one sodium chloride handshake. And that's strong, but a positive two, negative two, that's an even stronger stronger handshake, and that's going to be harder to break up. If we had a positive three, negative three 
compound, that would be higher yet than 2800 degrees because that should be even stronger. And by the way, all of the atoms here are about the same size. At least sodium and magnesium are close and chlorine and oxygen are close. Um, we're going to talk more about sizes in a future lecture. In addition to the metals with non-metals, and that's, those are broken down into fixed charge metals and variable charge metals, there, um, there is another set of compounds that only involves non-metals, and they call those molecular or covalent compounds. And these are compounds without ionic charges. So no positives, no negatives. And here's just some examples. So the one in the upper left there, nitrogen dioxide, carbon dioxide, to the right of it. Um, lower left corner is that organic molecule, methane, CH4, that we'll talk about more in Chem 222. And then there's also boron trichloride. These are all covalent molecules. And if you look here, these all involve nonmetals. There's no iron, there's no sodium, there's no chromium, there's no uranium. These are all nonmetals with nonmetals. And remember, hydrogen can kind of play the field. It can act both as a metal and a nonmetal. Naming these, is pretty easy. It's literally just the first name followed by the last name, and the formula is important. Like CO2 is always CO2, it's not O2C. Um, the second atom listed gets an IDE ending, so that means it's the negative side, all right? And you use a Greek prefix to tell how many atoms there are. Um, so you can see in these examples, it's nitrogen dioxide. So two oxygens, and one nitrogen. Oxygen is listed second for a reason. It's You should never write O2N, all right? So the O gets the ID ending, nitrogen dioxide. And carbon dioxide would be CO2, one carbon, two oxygens. Boron trichloride, boron and three chlorines. Methane is kind of the, uh, is a naming system we haven't looked at. You could call this carbon tetrahydride tetrahydride, carbon first, tetra is four, hydride is next. Um, the important thing here is that these Greek prefixes, which I think are, you're going to find are pretty easy to use, only for nonmetals with nonmetals, all right? Do not use them with metals and nonmetals. Ionic compounds have those positive and negative charges. None of these compounds, like CO2, BCl3, etc., none of those have positives and negatives. So nonmetals with a metal is ionic. Nonmetals with nonmetals are covalent, and you can use Greek prefixes. Do not use Greek prefixes if there's a metal present. Here are the Greek prefixes. Um, they may be familiar to you. They may not be. We're going to use these quite a bit, so make sure you know them. Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca, etc., etc. We'll use those quite a bit in this section. But again, only use these if there's nonmetals and nonmetals. So you can hopefully see it's going to be really important to know where things are on the periodic table. And you can always use a periodic table um, when you're studying taking exams from me, even if they're in class and stuff or quizzes. I love it, but make sure you've got a periodic table next to you. Let's find a name for N2O4, all right? And what I would do is I'd first try and figure out, all right, is there a metal present? And both nitrogen and oxygen are in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. They're above the metalloid line, so they're both non-metals. So this is now when we can use Greek prefixes. If the first atom listed has more than one, you do want to put in a Greek prefix. You always put a Greek prefix in the second atom, but the first one you only do if there's more than one atom. So because there are two nitrogens, that would be di-nitrogen. There are four oxygens. Four, you can see there is tetra. We're going to change oxygen to oxide. So the answer here would be dinitrogen tetraoxide. The first one is would be an incorrect name. Nitrogen oxide, you'd want to have a Greek prefix next to it because right now we don't know if this is nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, so that's a bad name. The second one, nitrogen dioxide, NO2. All right, so we could know that. 
Now, the next one, quad, is not a Greek prefix, so that would be a bad name. And the last one, tetraoxygen, no, no, no. The last element listed always gets an IDE ending. You would never use just oxygen. Notice how nitrogen dioxide, NO2, is different a little bit than dinitrogen tetraoxide. You don't call nitrogen dioxide mononitrogen dioxide. If the first one is by itself, you omit the mono. So NO2 is nitrogen dioxide. But if there's more than one, like N2O4, then even that one gets a Greek prefix, dinitrogen tetraoxide. Or tetroxide is fine too, but officially tetra. Okay, so kind of as an overview, there's three types of compounds. There's fixed charge metal plus non-metal. Those are ionic compounds. Those do not use Roman numerals or Greek prefixes. So Al2O3, aluminum is one of the stairs. Oxygen negative 2, non-metal. Aluminum oxide would be the name of that. There's also variable charge metal and nonmetal. These are also ionic bonding, but with these now you do want to use a Roman numeral. You don't need a Roman numeral with a fixed charge metals because everybody knows, or at least the hip chemist knows, aluminum's positive three and oxygen's negative two. But with the variable charge metals, if you just said iron oxide, you might go back and pick out FeO instead of Fe2O3, and there's actually several other possibilities. And you've got to know which one to use. So Fe2O3 is iron 3 oxide. There are three negative two oxygens, so the oxygens have a total of negative six charge. The two irons have to balance that with a positive six. That means each of those irons is a positive three. So Fe2O3 is iron 3 oxide. And again, it's important to use the Roman numerals because there is, for example, Example, an FeO. That compound is iron 2 oxide. And you've got to know which combination of iron and oxygen you're in. Remember the H2O versus H2O2. Okay, one extra atom can make you die, etc., etc. Finally now, there's nonmetal and nonmetal. These are covalent bonds. They're not as strong as ionic bonds, but they are more flexible. And covalent bonds are essentially the types of bonds that life uses, all right? And these guys use Greek prefixes. The second atom is gets an IDE ending, and it's important. The ordering is important. So P2O3 diphosphorus trioxide. There's also a P2O5, which would be diphosphorus phosphorus pentaoxide, etc., etc. These ones you'll use Greek prefixes. Now again, Greek prefixes for nonmetal plus nonmetal only, Roman numerals for variable charge metal plus nonmetals only. Fixed charge metal and nonmetals don't get anything. Acids. Want to go back there a little bit. Acids are important in chemistry. They're great sources of energy. And all acids have hydrogen ions. And most of the time, all right, acids will have an H+. Plus. That's the most common kind of hydrogen ion. There is a hydride, H negative one, but those are more rare. H plus by far more common. So if you have an acid, you list the H first. It's really important. That uh, shows the chemist that, that is an acid, and that's going to be a really important part of your molecule. Here are some common acids. HCl, hydrochloric acid. HNO3, we saw earlier, nitric acid. HClO4, perchloric acid. H2SO4, you may have heard of, sulfuric acid. And there's a whole bunch of other ones. So for example, HBRO, hypobromous acids. Um, we're going to look more at acids in chapter four. And also the nomenclature lab for Chem 221 will be helpful in figuring out what acids are all about. But for right now, just realize acids are acids because they have a super active H plus somewhere in the molecule. And knowing where the H plus is is important. That's why the H plus is listed first.
Acids and bases are complementary to each other. And acids and bases, if you have them interact, you get a lot of energy out. So a base is just as important to chemists, if I would argue, as an acid. So while acids had H plus as their thing that made them acidic, bases are metal hydroxides. And hydroxide is a polyatomic ion we talked about earlier. It's OH minus. So so bases are essentially sources of hydroxides, and if you have the hydroxide with a metal, you're going to have a base. The most common base by far is sodium hydroxide, NaOH. Now, Na always positive one, and OH minus hydroxide always negative one. They come together one to one, sodium hydroxide. If you've ever used Drano at your house, that's essentially a sodium hydroxide solution or sodium hydroxide pellet. KOH, potassium hydroxide, fairly common. LiOH, lithium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide, pretty common. Now, calcium is a positive two metal, and hydroxide still negative one. So you need two hydroxides. That's why it's Ca parentheses OH parentheses two, two hydroxides for one calcium. And you can have the variable charge metals as well. So, for example, iron three hydroxide is a compound. It's a positive three iron. Hydroxide's negative one, so you need three of them to make it Fe parentheses OH parentheses 3. And again, we're going to look more at bases in that same chapter 4 section and also in the nomenclature lab. When the hydrated compound, copper sulfate pentahydrate, is heated, the water molecules associated with the ionic solid are driven off, leaving copper sulfate with no associated waters. This compound is called anhydrous copper sulfate. Hydrated compounds are pretty common in uh, chemistry. Um, on the earth, we have a lot of water. And we're going to see that a lot of the metals, especially the transition metals, can take some of those waters and kind of glue them on to themselves. It's kind of hard to explain right now, but we'll talk about that this year. So a hydrated compound is just a regular compound, for example, copper 2 sulfate here, with some waters on it. So this CUSO4 4.5H2O. That's an example of a hydrated compound. Now, an advantage of the hydrated compounds is that, man, their colors are just freaking awesome, <laughs> all right? And I just love the colors of the transition metals in water. They're really spectacular. I use beautiful here with the highest respect because it's really cool. Um, if you heat the hydrated compounds, you'll make the same compound but without the water, and the waters will evaporate as a gas. That's what that means. So CuSO4, without the water, you would call that an anhydrous compound, which means without water. So CuSO4 is copper 2 sulfate. Copper 2 sulfate without the water would be anhydrous, and with it you'd say you had a hydrated version of copper 2 sulfate. It's pretty easy to name hydrated compounds. You just call the name what it would be normally, and then a Greek prefix hydrate after that. So that CuSO4.5H2O was copper 2 sulfate. Sulfate is negative 2. Copper, a variable charge metal, has to balance the negative 2 sulfate with a positive 2. So that's copper Roman numeral 2, copper plus 2, copper 2 sulfate. But because it's a hydrated compound, compound, we're going to put 5, penta is 5, and then hydrate. So copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate would be the name of a hydrated compound. Another common uh, one you'll see sometimes at the Fred Meyers even is MgSO4.7H2O. MgSO4 is magnesium sulfate, and because there are seven waters, seven is hepta, that would be magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. Um, the next compound is nickel 2 chloride hexahydrate. Chlorine as chloride is negative 1, and there's two of them. So the negative 2 is balanced by a positive 2 on the nickel, nickel 2 chloride hexahydrate. And again, if you t evaporate the water, which is usually possible, you end up making anhydrous versions. So if you hear anhydrous copper 2 sulfate, 
That just means it's copper two sulfate without the water. This next section, we're going to revisit the idea of what molar mass and, and the weights mean stuff, but now for molecules. And if you hear the term molar mass, all right, that's like a molecular weight. What's molecular weight? Good question. Molecular weight is the sum of all the atomic weights of the atoms in the molecule. So earlier, if you have a periodic table um, ready, you can see, for example, hydrogen is about 1.008. That's the atomic weight. That means an atom, an average atom of hydrogen, 1.008 AMU. But like we talked about in the last section, the more useful way of thinking it is as grams per mole. So 1.008 grams per mole. Now, molecular weight would mean add up the individual atoms atomic weight. So for example, for water, you'd add two hydrogens and an oxygen. And the number you calculate basically has two meanings. The one meaning would be the weight, if you will, of an average molecule. But the more interesting one, and the one we're going to focus on almost exclusively, is the molar mass. And that's how many grams of the molecule you need to make a mole. Remember, a mole of anything is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, in this case, molecules. That's Avogadro's number. So the molar mass will allow us to go from something we can measure, which is grams, into something like a counting unit, which is number of molecules. It's pretty cool. Let's say that you wanted to figure out the molar mass of ethanol, C2H6O. Ethanol is drinking alcohol, so uh, you have to be 21 and over in this country, 19 in Canada. No, I'm just joking. Um, you can figure out how many grams per mole are in ethanol using this kind of thing. Now, in the last section, if we wanted to find the molar mass of oxygen, you'd look on the periodic table. Oxygen is about 16.0 um, to three sig figs, so that would be 16.0 grams of oxygen in a mole of oxygen. We're going to do the same kind of thing now, but for a molecule. So this is ethanol. It has two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen. So each carbon on the periodic table to the hundredth, 12.01 grams per mole. And we'll multiply that by two because ethanol has two carbons. This number right here, that's the grams from just the carbon. And we'll do the same thing for the other atoms in the structure. So there's also six hydrogens and one oxygen. Hydrogen, 1.01 grams per mole times six, 6.06. .06. And oxygen, about 16 grams per mole, and there's one of them, so 16. So if you add up 24.02 plus 6.06 .06 plus 16, you get this number, 46.08 grams per mole. And that is the molar mass of ethanol. And that's an important number for chemists. If you have 46.08 grams of ethanol, you have a mole of ethanol. And a mole of ethanol, like a mole of anything, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So in this example, you would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of ethanol. So it's a pretty powerful technique. And again, it's very similar to what we did last section. Now we're just adding them up all together. Um, by the way, in chemistry, if you go to the hundredth, like 12.01, 1.01, most of the time your sig figs, you'll be good to go. All right, you can go out farther. You can go to some of these periodic tables, you can go to the thousandth or even ten thousandth, and that's fine. But it does take more time to calculate the molar mass, and you probably have better things to do um, than doing that. So I'm just going to let you know as a practical level, if you go to the hundredth, which is what I've done here, you should be good to go. Also, each periodic table is a little bit different, so your numbers might be slightly different than some of mine. If you use the one that I recommended for um, the problem set, which is found at mhchem.org slash pair tab, P-E-R-T-A-B, for periodic table, you can actually get it. If you don't have that or you can't find that periodic table, let me know. Um, but anyone will be fine. Um, also, you can find a molar mass calculator online or for your smartphone. And I do encourage you to get one of those if you can. We're going to do a lot of molar mass calculations, and you can absolutely do the 
process we just did. Um, and that's fine. But if you're doing a lot of them, it gets to be kind of a drag. So a molar mass calculator is something you might want to look into. Tylenol, C8H9NO2. And if you figure out uh, the eight carbons, so eight times 12.01, plus the nine hydrogens, nine times 1.01, plus the nitrogen, 14.01, plus oxygen, two times 16, you get 151.2. And for whatever reason, I only did it to a tenth here. Okay, weird instructor, but anyway, that's fine. Um, a hundredth would be better, but a tenth is okay too. So you get the idea. And this is going to affect your sig figs. If you needed a five sig fig molar mass, you would not want to use a molar mass with only four sigs, which is what I have right here. So do be aware that sometimes you need to add more sig figs depending on what your calculation status is. Water, H2O, by far the most common of all the things we're going to look at, and you might as well start getting used to what the molar mass is. So let's calculate the molar mass of water. So you'd have two hydrogens, two times 1.01, plus one oxygen, and oxygen is 16.00. So to that magic hundredths, which I've been getting off on here, that comes out to be 18.02 grams per mole, answer A. And we're gonna use that number a lot. So the more you hear it, the easier it gets to be. Water is about 18.02 grams per mole. And again, you can go out more sig figs if you want, 18.015. Um, you could also go less sig figs, like 18.0 would be three sig figs. But usually, like I said, to the hundredth, you'll be good to go. So 18.02 is what I use most of the time. These are all one mole amounts. So the, for example, for aspirin there, it says 180.2. That represents 180.2 grams of aspirin. And copper two chloride dihydrate with a molar mass of 170.5, that's 170.5 grams of that compound. And iron three oxide, which is essentially rust, by the way, 159.7 grams, water 18.02. Now, the reason they differ so much is the density is so much crazier. Um, water, of course, has a density of about one. Um, some of the other compounds are much greater, and I don't know them off the top of my head. But you're seeing different volume amounts depending on the density of the substance. But if you know the molar mass, you can figure out what a mole is. So each of those pictures there represents 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So for the aspirin, that would be molecules of aspirin. For the water on the far right molecules of water. People detect molar masses using a mass spectrometer, which is a really cool thing. This is a picture I showed in the last section. I'm just going to show it again. Um, the picture right here shows how atoms were found, isotopic abundance. So those are all like neon atoms and the isotopes. But you can do it for compounds as well. This is the uh, molar mass spectrum of ethanol, that drinking alcohol. Now, the molar mass of ethanol is 46.08 grams per mole. Notice that nomenclature, grams, moles, minus one, means grams divided by moles. X to the negative one in math is like one over X. So mole negative one means like one over moles. So sometimes chemists will write grams per mole as grams, moles, negative one. But anyway, molar mass 46. And notice how these lines here, which are like abundance, represents different parts. So there's actually a pretty good uh, peak there for or the version of ethanol without the H+, plus, that is a little bit acidic. Um, you'll learn more about this in organic chemistry. But if you can read these kind of things, you can find then the molar mass of your compound, which is pretty cool. Let's figure out how many moles of alcohol, which is drinking alcohol, ethanol, are in a standard can of beer if there are 21.3 grams of ethanol, C2H6O, in the beer, all right? Now, beer, like a lot of substances, has a lot of water, maybe hops or whatever, um, but in the can, there are 21.3 grams of ethanol. So let's use this information to find the moles. Now, to do this, we're gonna need the molar mass of ethanol. And earlier, we saw that the molar mass was 46.08 grams per mole. So with the grams of ethanol and the conversion from grams to moles, which is what molar mass is, you bet 
we can do this. 21.3 grams, our starting material. We want to make sure the grams cancel out. So 46.08 grams goes on the bottom, one mole on the top to three sig figs. 0.462 moles of ethanol is what we have. Whoopie doo, 21.3 grams. I don't know what 0.462 moles really means, you know, whatever, not that exciting. However, let's go the next step. So there's 0.462 moles of ethanol. I wonder how many molecules that might be. And you bet you can do this. This is what we did in the last section. You take the moles and you multiply by Avogadro's because that gets rid of the moles. You're left with just molecules. Multiply those numbers together. 2.78 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Now your 21.3 grams of ethanol is pretty small, but that represents more than 10 to to the 23rd molecules of ethanol. Remember that 10 to the 9th is a billion, so 10 to the 18th would be a billion billion molecules, and this is more than a billion billion molecules of ethanol in your standard can of beer. So when you eat uh, a sandwich or you drink a cup of coffee or beer for that matter, whatever, you're consuming just incredible number of molecules. It's just crazy how it is. But at least with these tools, you can figure out what it is and philosophize as to what they mean in a later time. But let's say you wanted to go a little further. So ethanol is C2H6O. And let's say that you wanted to figure out not just the number of molecules, but how many atoms of carbon there are. And that's a totally cool thing you can do with this kind of section too. So you've got 2.78 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of C2H6O. And if you look at that formula, Ethanol has two carbons per ethanol. And this number, the 10 to the 23rd, is the molecules of ethanol. So if you wanted just the atoms of carbon, multiply that number by two. And again, this two came straight from the formula, all right? That's where that two came from. If we would have been finding hydrogen atoms, we would have multiplied by six, six hydrogens per one molecule. Or we could have done oxygens, one oxygen per molecule. But anyway, Anyway, for carbon, this comes out to be 5.56 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So even more than that crazy number we had before, that's how many atoms of just carbon you're consuming. And if you wanted to take it to the ultimate spot, you could multiply that same number of molecules by nine because there are nine atoms in ethanol. Two carbons plus six hydrogens plus one oxygen is nine. So you multiply that number by nine. That tells you that your ethanol has 2.50 times 10 to the 24th atoms. So when you drink a can of beer, and you're ignoring, by the way, all the water and the hops or whatever else, you're just focusing on the ethanol, the part that makes people drunk, all right, then in theory, you would be consuming 2.50 times 10 to the 24th atoms in that ethanol. And that's just crazy. Now, I said in theory because uh, beers actually come with different amounts of alcohol in them, all right? Some of the fancier beers are, you know, 8% or so, and some of the lower beers are much less than that. So let's this 21.3, I think, is probably on the low end, but you could calculate what your favorite beer was, and root beer, even although you'd have to think about it as sugar, and oh, I'll just be quiet. The final thing we're going to look at is how empirical and molecular formulas for compounds can help chemists figure out what exactly is the identity of an unknown compound. So imagine that you're looking through your grandparents' uh, house and you come across in the garage this weird unknown chemical. And uh, the question is, what is the chemical? And chances are, because it's in the garage, you don't want to start drinking it or something or even smelling it. Um, we're 
worst case scenario, you'd be dead. <laughs> and worst, best case scenario, would probably just smell weird or be suspicious. So one of the ways that chemists get paid a lot is through identifying compounds. And we can use these techniques so far um, and see how this works out. Remembering that compounds are always in the same proportions. So NaCl is always table salt. It's never NaCl2 or Na2Cl. You can actually relate this to how much things weigh or what the mass is. So we're going to talk here a little bit about percent by weight or percent by mass. All right. All practical purposes for this class, weight and mass are the same. If you get into physics, it's not quite that same. Um, the ethanol we looked at earlier, you'll be able to do this by the end of the chapter. It's 52.13% carbon. It's 13.15% hydrogen and it's 34.72% oxygen. So you're probably like, hmm, how did they they get these numbers? And that's a really great question. Um, people, for example, that are trying to have low sodium diets uh, might want to know the percentage of sodium in the foods they eat, because if you are trying to keep sodium low, you don't want to have a lot of sodium. These percentages can be helpful for a whole bunch of different things. Nitric oxide is great as a substance because you can breathe it and it stays only in the lung and it doesn't cause any effects outside of the lung. Nitric oxide is made by cars and combustion engines and lightning and then is oxidized by oxygen or ozone in the atmosphere to nitrogen dioxide, which is even 10 or 20 times more toxic than nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is an extremely reactive free radical molecule which grabs the iron on the receptor enzyme and yanks it out of the plane of the ring and wakes up the enzyme. It's a very reactive molecule and it dilates the vessels in the lung and dilates only the vessels in the lung and lowers the blood pressure in the lung and is very useful both for babies and for adults with respiratory difficulty. And these babies who are born probably don't make enough of it themselves. We're just supplementing a natural gas with a natural pollutant, as it happens to be. To illustrate the utility of uh, percent by mass or percent by weight calculations, I think this is a good segue. Um, this shows um, the importance of nitrogen monoxide, nit one nitrogen and one oxygen. And just like water is the unofficial name for H2O, I mean, we'd really call it dihydrogen monoxide, but um, nitric oxide is the informal name for nitrogen monoxide. And there's a whole bunch of different nitrogen oxygen containing compounds. There's NO2, there's NO, uh, we saw N2O4 earlier and there's several of them around. Now NO uh, in the 70s was considered a major pollutant and it causes smog and stuff and uh, there's lots of bad things that can happen with NO kind of uncontrolled. So at that time nitrogen monoxide was seen as kind of a bad chemical but now uh, nitrogen monoxide is actually being seen as very useful. Um, it helps uh, babies to breathe better. Um, there's lots of mechanisms in the body where it can be really cool too. So I like what this guy says. It was once a pollutant and now it's being used in more um, important ways. But you must know if you have NO or NO2 or N2O or any of the different combinations thereof. And one way to do that is through these percent by mass calculations. If you want to find the weight percent of an element in a compound, the basic way is to first find the molar mass of the compound, put it in the bottom, the denominator, and in the top part, you'll put the grams of the element in the compound. So let's do an example with nitrogen dioxide, all right? And if you're going to find the weight percent of nitrogen and oxygen, the first thing, once again, is to find the molar mass. Now, very roughly, oxygen about 16 grams per mole, and there's two of them, so 16 times two is 32. Roughly, nitrogen is 14 grams per mole, so 32 from the oxygen plus 14 for the nitrogen, roughly NO2 is 46 grams per mole. You can do a better job to the hundredths place uh, with your calculator and periodic table than I can do off the top of my head, but roughly the number that goes in the bottom is going to be 46.
In the top, you want to put the grams of that element in the compound. So if this was oxygen, NO2, there's two oxygens, and 2 times 16 is 32. For a percent oxygen, you would put 32 grams roughly in the top and 46 grams, which is the molar mass, in the bottom times 100%. And that would be the weight percent of oxygen. Now for nitrogen, you only have one nitrogen nitrogen. That's about 14. So the weight percent of nitrogen would be 14 grams in the top and about 46 grams in the bottom, the molar mass times 100%. That's what you want to do. Now, you can do a better job and sig figs and all that kind of stuff than I just did. Here's an example of with water. All right, we saw earlier that the molar mass of water, 18.02 grams per mole was the molar mass. We'll put that in the bottom. Weight percent of oxygen, one oxygen, 16.00 grams. So the weight percent, 16.00 divided by 18.02 times 100%. Weight percent of oxygen, 88.79% oxygen. So going back to the NO2 example, here are better sig figs. So I said the molar mass was going to be about 46. 46.01 is even better, all right? And so for percent nitrogen then, you'd have the 14.01 grams of one nitrogen divided by the molar mass times 100%. Weight percent N, 30.45%. For oxygen, notice it's 2 times 16. That's because NO2 has two oxygens. So you put 2 times 16 divided by 46.01 times 100, 69.55%. Notice that your percentages of all the elements together should be 100%, and those look really good. Also, if you have 1% element and there's only another percent element, then 100% minus that number would be an alternative way to find the percent of the other one. So for example, if you had percent nitrogen, 30.45, you could also go 100 minus 30.45 to get that 69.55%. So lots of kind of cool ways to do that stuff here. Let's say that you wanted to figure out percent nitrogen in nitrogen monoxide, NO. All right, and the molar mass, which is what MM stands for, 30.01. So molar mass goes in the bottom, percent nitrogen, one nitrogen goes in the top. You'd have 14.01 divided by 30.01 times 100, and that number 46.68%, answer B. And again, to find percent oxygen, instead of 1 times 14.01 in the top, you'd go 1 times 16.00, the 1 oxygen. Divide by the molar mass times 100%, that would be the percent oxygen. You could, of course, also go 100 minus 46.68%. So one way that chemists can distinguish compounds from another is through the mass percent or the weight percent. So for example, in NO2, the weight percent of nitrogen, 30.45%, but for NO, 46.68%. So that is one method that can be used to find uh, one compound from another. But there's a problem. So this is an example of testing yourself for the weight percentages of nitrogen and oxygen in dinitrogen tetraoxide. Now, NO2 and N2O4 are quite different compounds. There's not a lot of similarities to them. But notice mathematically that NO2 times 2 is N2O4. So for example, for the percent nitrogen, if you were doing that calculation, it would essentially be 46.01 times 2 in the bottom. And for nitrogen, you'd have 14.01 times 2 because it's N2. The punchline of the test yourself question is that the percentages of nitrogen and oxygen in N and O and NO2 are the same as the percent nitrogen and percent oxygens in N2O4. Same percent composition. 
So it is not enough to know the percent composition or weight percent or mass percent. All these things mean the same thing. You have to know more than the percentages. And that's what makes this stuff a little tricky. There's lots of examples where compounds will have the same mass percents like NO2 and N2O4 here. They're especially in organic chemistry. That's very common. So we're going to start using the mole to take us to the next level. So when you want to figure out a formula, all right, basically you take a sample of what you're looking for, the substance you found in your grandparents' garage, and you'd send it away to the chemist. And they would end up doing two types of tests on it. And the simplest one is just to find percent by weight. And that's not a very hard process to do with modern technology. But back you'd get information which looks something like what we're going to do in this problem. This problem, we've got a compound. It has boron and hydrogen, and it's 81.10% boron. Now, we saved a little money, and we didn't have them do a percent hydrogen test. But if there's only two elements, 100% minus the percent boron will equal percent hydrogen, so we can find it out. Weight percentages, which is what we're doing here, are going to lead to empirical formulas, the smallest whole number ratio. And remember back at the beginning of this lecture, we talked about how empirical formulas are the smallest whole number ratios, but they may not be the actual molecular formula. So these mass percentages are going to lead us to empirical formulas, but they're not going to lead us all the way home yet. We'll talk about this. So to backtrack and make this simple, let's turn a mass percentage, like in this problem, into an empirical formula. What I try to do in problems like this is I assume 100 grams of sample. And if you assume 100 grams, then that means in an 81.10% boron, you would have 81.10 grams of boron. And in the chemistry world, we do everything by moles. So you've got to turn your grams of the elements into moles. So boron is 10.81 grams per mole. That would be 7.502 moles of boron in 81.10 grams of boron. Because I assumed 100 grams, 100 minus 81.10 will be the grams of hydrogen. And in your calculator, that comes out to be 18.90 grams. What this also means, of course, is that our sample was 18.90% hydrogen, but we were too cheap, apparently, to do that. <laughs> anyway, that's how you find the grams of the other piece. 100% minus the one you know gives you the one you don't know. Anyway, let's turn that into moles as well. So 18.90 grams divided by 1.008 grams per mole, 18.75 moles of hydrogen. So this is the moles of boron in the sample. If we have 100 grams, this is the moles of hydrogen, if you assume 100 grams. And you could assume 1 gram, you'd have 0 0.8110 grams of boron and 0 0.1890 grams of hydrogen. But 100 grams is just really easy, so that's why I use it. But if you'd rather do a different number, go for it. Now, these two mole ratios, these two mole amounts actually are important. We're going to make like ratios out of them. You could write this as, if you will, uh, a, a formula B7.502H18.75. But that's a really ugly formula. And none of the formulas I've shown you in this class, or none that I ever will, will be that ugly. So what you want to do is you want to find whole numbers. And the easiest way is just to divide both numbers by the smaller. So 7.502 is smaller than 18.75. And 7.502 divided by itself is 1. And that's what I'm doing right here. All right, We're taking the bigger number and dividing it by the smaller number. That automatically means that the smaller number is going to be 1. And in this case, you end up with a ratio which is almost 2.5. Now, in a formula, you have to have whole numbers, no fractions, all right? So 2.5 times 2 would be one way to do this. Like, you could have 2.5, 2 and a half moles of hydrogen per boron, but um, you won't see in chemistry like a BH 2.5. That would be 
pretty ugly and unusual. So instead of 1 to 2.5, let's multiply both of those by 2. If you do that, you will get whole numbers. Empirical formula here, B2H5. So let's review the steps. We turn percentages into grams by assuming 100 grams. We turn the grams of elements into moles. And that's kind of a rough structure. And that's what I kind of was doing right here in the corner. But it's too ugly. <laughs> All right. So we're going to divide both of the numbers by the smaller number, 7.502. You might get like a 2.5 to 1 ratio. And that's better. But you want to get whole numbers. So if you don't have a whole number, figure out a way to get it to a whole number. 2.5 times 2 is 5. If you do it to the top, you got to do it to the bottom. B2H5 empirical formula. That's the smallest whole number ratio of atoms in this formula. This is not, though, the molecular formula. Boron and hydrogen form a whole bunch of different kinds of compounds. And B2H5 may or may not be the one we're looking for. B2H6 down there, a picture of it, that's an example of one of the compounds that happens between boron and hydrogen. Notice, if you're tricky, that there is a weird arrow for, uh, going from the hydrogen to the boron right there and another kind of arrow going from the hydrogen to boron right there. Boron is a group 3A element, and I'm going to call all the 3As, as I said earlier, twisted metals. And this is the first example we've seen of where boron, and aluminum can do this, and gallium, etc., why that's the case. That arrow means something. And we'll talk about this later. I'm sorry, I'm going to tease you right now with it, and I'm sorry, but just realize there's a reason for the arrow, and it has to do with these twisted metals. But anyway, back to the regular scheduled thing. We want to turn our B2H5 empirical formula into a molecular formula. And what that means is our molecular formula could be B2H5, like we saw water was one to one, but it could also be the empirical times two, which would be B4H10. If you take the empirical formula and multiply it by three, three times two is six, five uh, times three is 15, you keep B6H15, could be times four, B8H20, et cetera, et cetera. So at least we know now that there's going to be two borons for every five hydrogens in the formula, but what is the final formula? What is the molecular formula? Molecular formula is kind of the holy grail of this section. To figure out the molecular formula, the holy grail, we need the molar mass of the compound. So when we sent that sample of the stuff we found in your grandparents' garage to the chemist, they did not only a weight percent analysis, which told us it had boron and hydrogen, or boron and, hy boron and hydrogen, excuse me, in the uh, sample, but we also have to do a second test. The chemist would do a second test, which was the molar mass of the compound. And that doesn't say anything about what's in the compound, like does it have hydrogen or uranium or arsenic or whatever, but it does tell you that in a mole of the molecule, you have that many grams. So what we're going to do is we're going to find uh, the molar mass of the empirical formula, which is something we can do right now, and compare it to the molar mass of the compound. And if we do that, we're going to get a whole number ratio. And that whole number ratio will multiply by the empirical formula to get the molecular formula. So let's back up here a little bit. The stuff we found in your grandparents' garage, we don't know what it is. We sent it to the chemists. The chemists are really going to do two types of tests on it. The first one gave us the percentages by weight or percentages by mass, and we turned that into B2H5. But the second test is going to be so many grams per mole in the molecule itself. So if we compare that number from the second test to the molar mass of the empirical formula, B2H5, that's going to give us a whole number that we can use to find the molecular formula. And if that's as clear as mud, I understand. Let's go through some examples.
Let's say that we have a compound. It has an empirical formula of CH2. So we already did the percent analysis and we found it was one carbon for every two hydrogens. But we, in our second, second test, we find that the molar mass of the compound, 28.1, grams per mole. Remember, mole minus one means per mole. We can use this information to find the molecular formula, and it's not as hard as it might seem. But what we want to do is we want to first find the empirical formula's molar mass. We're going to compare that to the molar mass of the compound, and that did come from an outside experiment. This is a whole separate experiment. CH2 has one carbon, which is 12.01 grams, and it has two hydrogens, 1.01 grams. So the molar mass of CH2, the molar mass of the empirical formula, 14.03 grams per mole. We're going to compare the 14 number to the molar mass of the whole compound, which is this 28.1 number. And this will always give us a whole number. No fractions, no multiplying by any integrals or anything. It's always going to be a whole number. So if you take 21, excuse me, if you take 28.1 and you divide it by 14.03, you can probably see that's almost exactly a 2 to 1 ratio. That 2 is important. We're going to multiply the empirical formula CH2 by 2. That means the molecular formula here, C2H4. So what we did, we did a whole separate experiment to find the molar mass of the compound, 28.1. We calculated the molar mass of the empirical formula. In this problem, it was CH2, so that was one carbon, two hydrogens, 14.0 grams per mole. Molar mass of the whole thing, 28, divided by molar mass of the empirical, about 2 to 1. That means 2 empirical formula units per molecular formula. We multiplied the EF by 2 to get C2H4, the MF, molecular formula. So CH2, the empirical formula, times 2 molecular equals the molecular formula. The simplest carbohydrate is glyceraldehyde. Its empirical formula is CH2O. The molar mass of the whole thing, 90.08 grams per mole. So which one of these represents the molecular formula? Now the molecular formula will be some ratio of CH2O. So CH2O and A, it could be. If you take CH2 twice, it would be C2H4O2. That would be answer B. Times 3 would be C. It definitely will not be be E because there's you CHO would be one to one to one. You have two hydrogens per carbon per oxygen, so that's not going to be right. What you want to do in this problem is you want to find the empirical formula's molar mass. So you want to find the molar mass of CH2O by itself. You'll add up carbon plus two hydrogens plus oxygen. Carbon's about 12, hydrogen's about one times two, and oxygen's about 16. That comes out to be about 30. 30 grams per mole, you want to compare that number 30 to the molar mass of the whole thing, 90. And you can see that 90 over 30 is about 3. That means you want to take your empirical formula three times to get the molecular formula. So the answer here does come out to answer C, the empirical formula taken three times. Now, back to how we did this. Molar mass of the empirical formula, one carbon, two hydrogens, one oxygen, about 30 grams per mole. Molar mass of the whole thing, 90.08 divided by 30. Three is the ratio, and these ratios will always be whole numbers. So empirical formula with CH2O, multiply it by three, the number you just got, C3H6O3 is the final answer. Going back to our boron hydrogen compound, the empirical formula was B2H5 when we want to find the molecular formula. What we're going to need is the molar mass. So if we do the molar mass of the stuff from your grandparents' garage, which is a whole separate kind of experiment, it comes out to be 53.3 grams per mole. And we can use this and the empirical formula to find the molecular formula. So just like we did with the last couple 
examples. Let's find the empirical formula's molar mass. Find the molar mass of just B2H5. So B2H5, 2 times boron plus 5 times oxygen, 26.67 grams per mole. So the molar mass of B2H5 is 26.67. We then use that number, we put it in the bottom, we put the molar mass of the whole thing, this number, 53.3 in the top, you're always going to get whole numbers, this is a whole number of 2. So what that number 2 means, you want to take your empirical formula and multiply it by 2. So B4H10 is our molecular formula, and that's kind of a cool thing. This is kind of a holy grail for chemists to find that number right there, that formula. Pretty cool. So when we did this problem, this is an overview, we first converted the percent by mass element values into moles. And I like 100 grams, but you can use anything you want. We then turned the moles into an empirical formula. You take the bigger one on top and the smaller one on the bottom. You might have more than one, more than two elements. The smaller one always goes on the bottom. And the idea is you want to get to smallest whole number ratios. So when the ratio we did, it came out to be 2.5 to 1, and that's better, but we want whole numbers. We multiplied by 2 to get B2H5. That found the empirical formula. The molecular formula, we needed the molar mass of the whole thing, 53.3 grams per mole. We calculated the empirical formula's molar mass, P2H5 came out to be 26.67 grams per mole, two borons and five uh, hydrogen. That ratio will always be a whole number, no fractions or anything like that. And this ratio is two to one. So we took our empirical formula, multiplied it by that two to get the molecular formula, B4H10. If you follow these steps, you will be good to go all the way through the end of Chem 223, no problem. There are other uses of these kind of processes, and this is another example I'd like to show you. This is a reaction where you're taking some tin and iodine. Um, the picture on the far left shows tin on the left and iodine kind of a crystal on the right. And you can heat the iodine up and it can dissolve in a solvent, depends on what kind of substance you're doing. Anyway, and you're putting it through uh, a piece of filter paper and you end up with an orange tin iodine. That's what that stuff is right there. But the question is, what is the formula of the tin iodine? Now, tin is a variable charge metal. Iodine is always negative one. So the question is then, from this kind of data, like how can we find the formula uh, of the tin iodide? Using uh, some experiment, we started with 1.056 grams of tin. We put 1.947 grams of iodine in with the tin. And at the very end of the reaction, we had some tin left over, some 0.601 grams. We isolated it with the filter paper. So what we're going to do here is we're going to find the grams of tin used in the reaction. We'll turn it into moles. We're also going to turn the grams of iodine and by the way, iodine is a diatomic. Have no fear of ice clear brew. So we're going to turn grams of moles into moles of iodine. And we'll compare the moles of tin and the moles of iodide to find the empirical formula. 1.947 grams of the I2 were used. The tin, though, we didn't use all of the tin up. Some of it was left over at the end. So we started with 1.056 grams, and we had 0.601 grams of tin left. So 1.056 minus 0.601 means we used 0.455 grams. Now, we're going to use that 0.455 grams and turn that number into moles, because that's the amount of tin that reacted with the iodine. So let's find the moles of tin. We're going to use the 0.455 because that's how much was used up. Tin is about 118.7 grams per mole. Still got the three sig figs going through. So 3.83 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of tin were placed into the beaker and used to make that orange stuff. We're going to do the same thing with the iodine. Now, you've got to be careful because in a compound, you want just individual iodines. You don't want the I2. But the diatomics, like we talked about, 
always come in pairs. So for the molar mass, you want to use 2 times iodine. So 2 times the number for iodine, which is about 126.904, comes out to be 253.81. And so figuring out this number then is moles of I2. But in a compound with tin and iodine or magnesium and iodine or anything, you want just individual I atoms. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert the I2 into just I. So we'll multiply it by 2. There's 1.534 times 10 to the minus 2 mole of iodine atoms used in this reaction. Don't use the I2. You want just the individual I's. We know the moles of tin, we know the moles of I. So again, bigger on the top, smaller on the bottom. The iodine is bigger, it goes on the top, the tin goes on the bottom. You can see that this ratio is almost exactly four to one. Four iodines per tin, and iodine as iodide is always a negative one charge. So the tin has to balance the four negative ones with a positive four. This is a tin plus four, so we would call all that compound, that orange compound, tin for iodide. And this is one way that people can find then the ratios uh, or the formulas for these variable charge metals. Again, the nonmetals coming through, kind of a cool way that people can use. Okay, that's it for Chapter 2, Part 2 Lecture Notes. Um, as always, there is a study guide um, available online or in the Companion, which is a bulleted list of highlighted compounds or topics you can look through. Make sure you're good to go. Um, the concept guide has some worked problems, and that's going to become more important. So, for example, if you're uncertain about molar mass or how to find mass percent from a formula or molecular formulas, you might check that out. Um, there are also some important equations following this lecture slide that you're welcome to check out. And then finally, also after the important equations, there are some sample problems that you can use to test yourself. The answers are on the next page, so kind of make sure you're good to go. If you do have any questions, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help you. Um, I'm really rooting for you. Good luck with your studying.